I'm back in Coopville today on northern Whidbey Island, taping. The wind is kicking up around me. And there's that peaceful craft in the background of the Hen Cove, just uh, anchored there. Sails uh, sheeted. And this is a second, some second introductory remarks that I have to open the course on history of psychology as an online narrative. And I want to op open this, make this opening by way of a classic book um, that I will call the Green Book. It's by Edna Heidbretter, and it is her Seven Psychologies, um, published in 1933. And here is the title page, Seven Psychologies by Edna Heidbretter, PhD. And notice she's an associate professor at Minnesota. Um, and this is published uh, by Appleton Century Crofts, New York City, where most of the publishers were in those days. But um, the date of the publication, the year 1933, and Edna's status at Minnesota are in themselves telling because it means that Edna had broken ground in becoming a, uh, a tenured professor in a psychology department as a woman. This was not often achieved in those days, back in the 30s, the early 30s. This, this was a status that was not so often achieved by women. And recall that Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first PhD in America, uh, took her degree at Cornell, who was then uh, opening up opportunities for women under uh, Edward Titchener, who was uh, progressively progressive minded back then. Harvard wasn't, that's for sure. And, uh, but here's Heidbretter now uh, a generation later as a tenured professor What's more, the book she gives us, Seven Psychologies, um, recounting and describing the ascent of seven schools of psychology in America, is a masterwork. So this is not just some assistant professor who wrote a book or somebody who wrote a book to get tenure, as so many do. This is a woman who is a phenomenal writer and, uh, and captures moments in the evolution of these schools that are articulate, that are eloquent, and that are insightful beyond anything her male, her male counterparts are doing at Minnesota or elsewhere. In fact, you won't find a book like this anywhere else that, that is so timely in capturing What's going on in American psychology in relation to the movements, the important movements? So um, if we look at the title page of her tome, the Green Book, here that we see. We can ask ourselves, well, what are the seven schools? And we have this, a few uh, introductory chapters in this book, Pre-Scientific Psychology. I'm opening my course by way of uh, talking about mesmerism and hypnotism, the, evo uh, the evolution and development of hypnotism through the 18th and 19th centuries. Well, she talks about pre-scientific psychology, but it is really, and then, and then the beginnings of scientific psychology, but it is really these next chapters that are the core of the book and they span Titchener and his structuralism. We've already mentioned this by way of Margaret Floyd Washburn's career. But Titchener came from Europe to Cornell and he founded what arguably was the first American psychology. I mean you could say William James's was the first if you consider him to be an authentic psychologist. If you consider him a philosopher, 
were spiritualists, then Titchener's was the first. Um, and she moves to the psychology of William James and captures that in several aspects uh, wonderfully. Functionalism emerged at the University of Chicago, and so did John Watson uh, emerge from the University of Chicago before he came to uh, Johns Hopkins and launched the behavioral movement. He was a, a lab manager at uh, Chicago. And so that school, you've probably heard of John Dewey. Uh, Dewey is attached to that school. And William James, if you go back into his archives at Houghton Library in Harvard, you will find a letter written by William James to uh, John Dewey, I believe it is, dubbing functionalism as a, as a legitimate school of psychology. And I don't recall the year of that, but I do have a copy of that letter. Then you have behaviorism. And that is the first wave of behaviorism. And one of the beautiful things about this book is that it captures behaviorism before a guy named B.F. Skinner ever came on the scene. Skinner is around in the late 20s doing things, but he's doing things as a writer. He wants to be an American novelist. And he has some favorable reviews of his writing by Robert Frost. He goes off to write the great American novel, and he fails. He falls short. He realizes he has no story to tell, so he becomes part of a second wave of behaviorists. And there is a third wave of behaviorism that uh, I encountered at the University of Washington, and that persists to this day. Clinical behaviorists. You have the dynamic psychology at Columbia University, and this one I will, I know the least about, and will cover the least in my course. You have Gestalt psychology, and there are a couple waves of Gestaltism. Um, she captures the early wave when Gestalt psychology comes to America in 1910, and this sets itself up here. Uh, a second wave of Gestalt psychology applied Gestalt principles within clinical practice, and that's the work of uh, people like Fritz Perls and others, who's a brilliant uh, clinician in applying these principles. But the principles were more theoretical by 1910 and they were perceptual. So part of the brilliance of the Gestalt clinicians is that they applied these perceptual principles in clinical practice. And then uh, lastly, uh, Freud and the psychoanalytic movement, and this is probably one of her weaker chapters uh, when it's written. I, I'm guessing she wasn't a psychoanalyst herself and she does put it last. Um, and so there you have it, uh, psychoanalytic, gestalt, dynamic, behaviorism, functionalism, the psychology of William James, and structuralism as the seven psychologies, or the systems of psychology, or the schools of psychology, as other people call them. So, um, so this by way of introduction, and I will give a, another short part to this is a concluding, her concluding remarks in the book, I think are just, again, um, eloquent and insightful and really capture some exciting things that have happened all by this year, 1933. So in, in some respects, Edna Heidbreder is better positioned to give the history of psychology than maybe anybody before her or possibly anybody after her for that reason. And it's a wonderful book and it's out of print. You might find it uh, in borrowing through Summit or through your local library. You might be able to get a hold of a copy. Mine came from an Eastern Washington Baptist University library. So they're a little hard and a little rare to get, but uh, really a wonderful read. And I use this very often in teaching my University of Washington history courses back in the 90s and in the early part of the uh, early decade. So Edna Heiberter, Seven Psychologies.